This is like the high point in the two books almost. So um, it's really important. And today, fortunately, we have, we have lions. <laughs> Just kind of makes things more colorful. Uh, we have lions in two kind of ways. And so, uh, so we start with lions. So when you see a lion in the grass like this, right, you should, you should get a little scared, you know, if the lion's not looking at you, you're probably safer. But but as soon as this, the lion starts looking at you and doing this, then it's a bigger cause for alarm, right? And then if you have house cats, you've seen house cats take this posture. They're hunting, right? <laughs> so uh, so this this is an animal of prey that's hunting. And uh, and today this is just a, a picture of what's going on in Ezra in uh, many ways is this kind of hunting posture. So so we're going to talk about lions. Uh, from that perspective and from another perspective. So where we are, where are we? I'll catch you back up. Again, my thanks to Steve for speaking last week. That was wonderful. Um, We are in Ezra and Nehemiah. They are historically the last stories in the Old Testament. I mean, in terms of the narrative of the Old Testament, like what's going on before Jesus comes, these are the last, the last pieces of history in the Old Testament is Ezra and Nehemiah. And then you say to yourself, well, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. When I look in my Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah are, oh, they're before Psalms in my Bible. Why aren't they at the end of the Bible if they're the last history in the Bible? Well, you know, who put the order of the Bible books together is another talk for another time. But it turns out that the stuff that is at the end of your Bible are the major and minor prophets. And those guys were in operation during this narrative. They are guys that show up in this narrative. So these are prophets that are speaking truth in the middle of all this craziness going on. What was the craziness going on in the end of the Old Testament that these guys were speaking for for God in? It was what you see in Ezra and Nehemiah. This is the last piece of history. And after the end of Nehemiah, it turns out there's this four centuries of of no history at all, and then Jesus shows up. So that's what we're looking at. It's the last of that, Ezra and Nehemiah. And so I kind of contracted them together because it's a crime not to study both of them together. So I call it Easy Maya, Ezra, Nehemiah. Yeah, it's just a catchphrase. So we're in, we're in the Ezra part right now. But these two books cover 100 years. They cover 100 years of history. And, uh, and I, want you to, I want you to remember that 100 years right there because that'll, that'll become really important a little bit later today is that 100 years right there. So keep that in your mind that Ezra and Nehemiah cover 100 years uh, not just a small incident. And, uh, and we're going to look at this restoration of the temple is what they call it. So here's the history. Here's the history. If we dial all the way back to 722 B.C., that's before Christ, right? 722, you still have the nation of Israel on the left there. And it's by this time separated into the northern and southern kingdom because after Saul was king and David was king and Solomon was king, when Solomon dies, They don't agree across the country who should be the next king, so there's a division that happens. People in the north want someone who's not an ancestor of David's. People in the south say, no, 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 we have to have someone who's the bloodline of David. So there's a separation between the kings, and actually you end up with a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. So they're they're separate politically and even religiously. Religiously, why? Well, because where is the temple, which is the center of the religious heart of the country? It's in Jerusalem. Is it in the north or the south kingdom? It's in the south kingdom. So the people in the north who come to hate the people in the south won't go in the south to to do what they're supposed to do at the temple and all the feasts and stuff. So they stay in the north and they kind of make up their own flavor of Judaism in the north. They're also contaminated. We'll talk about that contaminated factor in a second. But this is the status in 722. So about, I don't know, maybe 200 years after Solomon dies, you have the two kingdoms that are separated. And there's larger kingdoms in the entire world that are going around. Assyria is one of them. By the time you get to 722, Assyria decides we're going to invade Israel. So, of course, the natural defenseless direction to get into Israel is always from the north. It's always from the north. So they come around from the Assyrian Empire. They come down, they attack the north, and they just haul all those people away into captivity. And now they all live in the Mesopotamian Valley. The people in the north, the southern kingdom still staying behind. So they're there. This was typical at the time in ancient cultures. If you wanted someone to wash your dishes or mow your lawn, till your fields... <laughs> You would go to another country and you'd capture people and you'd bring them back to be slaves. This is just what you did. This is how, you know, we go down, we go down to something like, I don't know, Home Depot and buy a dishwasher. They would actually go invade a country and 
take dishwashers. That's what they did. So this is what they did. They hauled away the, the northern kingdom over, and that was in 722, so that's seven centuries before Jesus. Now, kingdoms come and kingdoms go. So the Assyrian Empire then got taken over by the Babylonian Empire in roughly the same area in the Mesopotamia River Valley. So that's where they are. The Babylonians come around. Very famous king we know about, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's in charge of that. He gets the same idea. Hey, there's still people left in Israel. We need dishwashers and mowers of lawns. Let's go invade. So they invade Israel, and they come over, and after the invasion, they take the people of the southern kingdom over, and they come to basically the same area because both the Assyrian and the Babylon, Babylonian kingdoms were in the same area. So now you've got all these displaced Jews that are over in the Mesopotamia area. That's by about 586, really, really well-known date. Okay, then an amazing thing happened about 70 years later. The Persian Empire takes over, and King Cyrus of the Persian Empire says, let's, let's let these people go back and rebuild their temple. What? I know. It's a, total, it's a total miracle. King Cyrus says, go back and build your temple. Clearly a godly influence thing on King Cyrus. And he says, not only go back and build your temple, which is basically trashed when the southern kingdom got taken by Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, the, the temple's just gone. Solomon's temple, it's just gone. It's been, it's been raised to the ground. So he says, you need to go back and build your temple, get back into the rituals that you're doing with your temple and what your God desires of you. And oh, by the way, Solomon's temple and the second temple now, which is gonna be built, needs to have a lot of gold in it because that's the specification if you look back in Exodus. So how are slaves who've been enslaved for two generations in Babylon, how are they gonna have the gold to go back and, and do what you're supposed to do to make the temple? How are they gonna have the money to buy the timbers from Lebanon, they're gonna span the roof because they're very expensive and huge. I mean, how, who, how are slaves gonna do that? So Cyrus says, not only go back and rebuild the temple, but here's all this cash. He gives them cash. And he says, lucky for you, when Nebuchadnezzar came through and trashed your temple, you know all those gold bowls, all those gold uh, implements, all those silver things, silver, you know, all that stuff that he took that, right? Right, well, he didn't melt it down. What? No, he took it and he put it in his temples. So Cyrus says, when you go back, here's all the stuff that came from your temple 70 years ago. And take this and put this in your temple when you get it rebuilt. It's, just, it's absolutely astonishing. So they come back and they're doing that. And that's what this story of Ezra and Nehemiah is about. It's coming back, starting first with rebuilding the temple and then eventually rebuilding the walls in Nehemiah. It's the reestablishment of that place. Had it not been for God's influence on Cyrus, the king of Persia, this would never have happened. Because he says, let's let the dishwashers go home. I, <laughs> who does this? No, nobody does this. I mean, according to historians, at the time that the southern kingdom was taken, there should never again on the face of the earth be a nation of Israel. They, they should be eternally scattered and, and they are the diaspora spread across the world. They should never have come back as a nation. But God had a promise to the nation, and the promise of that nation meant to reconstitute it here several centuries before Jesus, and at the, at the command of Cyrus, the king of Persia. Oh. So that's where we're at right now in the story, is they're in the process of rebuilding this. <clears throat> By the way, I'll show you some pictures. Here's one of them, uh, and I, I talked about this a couple, about a month ago about the fact. This is a, this is a little recreated model of first century Jerusalem that's at, uh, it's, it's, now it's at a museum in downtown Jerusalem. And uh, if you ever go to Jerusalem, ask to see this, this, this model. It takes up the whole, kind of the whole back garden of this, of this museum there. But this is actually the, the best archeological evidence, what it really looked like. And they do all of the, uh, they do the entire city of Jerusalem in little limestone blocks, about the size of sugar cubes. <laughs> It's, it's really pretty astonishing. And so when they, when they did the temple, this is, a, this is a version of what the temple looked like in the first century, the time of Jesus, where you have the temple in the center, right, of the picture, and then you have this really large, flat kind of promenade, I don't know what you call it, a big flat area meeting place. Um, that was actually built later on. But what they're building right now in Ezra is this center section. In fact, maybe not even quite that big, maybe just that thing in the middle. That's what they're building. And so what they're building four centuries before Jesus in the story of Ezra is exactly the same core temple that Jesus saw in the first century, that core right there in the center. And that's, that's what we're talking about. Now, the, 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 uh, the rest of this area was built by Herod the Great. Herod expanded that because at the time the temple was built, 
uh, by Solomon, and then subsequently this second temple by Ezra and Nehemiah. When that when that temple is built, it's just it's actually just on the top of a hill inside Jerusalem. Um, it's a it's a really well known hill. It turns out. And so they build the temple on top of that. Herod decided, look, we have millions of people that come in year after year for the festivals they got to come into town for. They're just all over the place. We need a big flat open area for them to meet in. So he built this gigantic flat area around it, that, around the edge here. So the flat area you see around the temple, Herod, you know, within the century before Jesus and up to the point of Jesus. And also the walls around it, surrounding it. To, to this very day, if and when you go to, to Israel, you can see some of the stones that Herod built around the edge of this. See that large wall around the temple area? Uh, many of those stones still exist. Some were built on top of subsequently, but some of the lower ones you can see today are clearly Herod's stones. And so when the Jews were allowed back into Israel in the Six-Day War in 1967, and they were allowed, not Israel, but allowed back in Jerusalem, they wanted to get as close to the old temple as possible. So what they do is they meet at the Wailing Wall, have you heard of that, or the, or the Western Wall? It's, it's the wall just on the other, right down here. You go here, you can go down two stories, it's right down there. So what they're looking at are these stones that clearly, clearly existed in the first century, built by Herod. And that's the closest they can get to the old temple area is the base stones on that wall. That's the Wailing Wall, this very day. That's as close as they can get. Too much history yet? Just wait. Okay. Um, okay, one more, one more thing before we hit the passage, because this is super important, super important. So if we flash back again to 722, go back in your calendar, 722, you got the Assyrian Empire going on. You got the Northern Kingdom still in captivity. It turns out that a crazy thing happened after they evacuated the, this northern area, which in general is called Samaria. The northern part is in general called Samaria by the time of Jesus, and even before that. It turns out that the Assyrians said, you know what, we don't want Jews leaking back into that northern land or else, you know, they might start over again as Jews. So we need to displace them. Let's put people there that don't, don't normally live there. And so here's the passage we know about this. They, they gather people from all the other conquered peoples who are also in the Mesopotamian area. And here's what it says in 2 Kings 17. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, that's that, Kuth, Ava, Hamath, Sepharavaim and place them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. They took foreigners and they seated them in the north, okay? And they took possession of Samaria and lived in its cities. So the, the king of Assyria says, this is smart. Let's take foreigners and make them live in the houses that, that we pulled the Israelis out that used to live there. And we'll make sure that the north then will always be subservient to us because these are conquered peoples that we took from other lands. And then we say, look, if you stay true to us, we'll give you all this great real estate in the north of Israel, houses you never built, vineyards you never planted, put you there as long as you stay faithful to me, the king of Assyria. So that's what he did. So he picks foreigners and puts them up there. It goes on in 2 Kings 17. The king of Assyria was told, <clears throat> here's a problem. The nations that you've carried away, right? So these are all captives that he carried away and placed in the cities of Samaria. You know, they don't know the law of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent <gasps> lions. I was thrilled when I read that, but you know. He sent lions among them and behold, they're killing them. They're killing them. Why? Because they don't know the law of the God of the land. Now, this is what the king of Assyria is thinking. He's thinking, we put all these foreigners into Samaria, and they're dying from lions. That tells me they're not living really wisely in the land. If they knew about the God of that land, then we might be able to keep the lions away, and they'll stay there. I, this is his thinking. So what's the solution? Again, in 2 Kings 17, 27. So the king of Assyria commanded, <clears throat> send there one of the priests whom you carried away, one of the Jewish priests. Send up a Jewish priest back. <laughs> I just laugh every time I read this. Send a Jewish priest back whom you carried away from there and let him go and dwell there and teach them the law of the God of the land. So take, take a Jewish priest that's in captivity in Mesopotamia, send him back there, have him school the people there and saying, look, you want to get rid of lions? You got you to gotta worship the God of Israel. Well, even at the time that they were taken, they weren't really true to the God of Israel, but they sort of had a hint about worshiping the God of Israel because they were so fallen. Anyway, so he sends a, he sends a, a priest back. How does that work out? 33. Well, eventually they feared the Lord. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. They, they did. They, they got schooled and they said, okay, we can do that. 
<clears throat> but they also serve their own gods. Oh, don't do that. So they, they, they mix it. This is a thing called uh, syncretism, where you actually take two different beliefs and you smoosh them together. They were doing that in the north. But evidently, they took care of the lions. But they, they, understood, they understood the gods of Israel, and they, and they understood their own gods. So, you know, playing their bets, they decided to worship both. After manner of the nations from among whom they'd been carried away. And, and to this day, the writer for <laughs> Second King, to this day, they do according to the former manner. They're still doing this to this very day. And if you picked up and put yourself in first century J uh, Jerusalem when Jesus was there, you could turn around to the people in Samaria and say, and they're still doing this to this day. That was the Samaritans. That was why the Samaritans had such a bad reputation with the Jews of the South who were more orthodox in a sense because they had the temple there. They, they believed biblical things. The people in the North, eh, a little screwy. Well, from this time in the past, they'd been contaminated with this admixture of foreigners and some Jews and it was just crazy stuff so that's that's why when Jesus decides to put together the parable of the good Samaritan he decides to choose as a hero of the story someone of a bad reputation among the holy Jews in the south why well because remember the guy gets injured he's left for dead on the road in the story and righteous guys from the south Righteous religious guys come by and pass by him and do not do any good to him. And he says, but look, a Samaritan did the right thing. The Samaritans that you despise, he's saying in the story, know to do the right thing when you, you righteous Orthodox guys, will not lift a finger. That's why the Samaritan part of the story is so powerful. That's the Samaritans. Okay, we are now ready to read. Are you ready? <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. Okay. <sighs> They come back to the land, but in chapter 4, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, so by the way, the southern kingdom has, has uh, nicknames, and one of its nicknames is Judah, because that's the dominant tribe in the south, okay? And they'll many times mention Benjamin, because Benjamin is in the south too, and there was speculation that Benjamin didn't get taken away during the Babylonian captivity. So, so the people that came back, largely Judah and tiny Benjamin. Okay, so that's what he's saying. That's his catchphrase. When the adversaries of the people in the south, Judah and Benjamin, heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel, and before we say what they did, this adversaries thing is what we're going to talk about today. The people in, this, in the north who had actually been there for a, oh, 150 years or so, they, they are saying, look, we, we're feeling really nice living here in the north without the people in the south who are always on our backs about our religious problems. So let's say we like how we like the balance of power now. Now that they're coming back in the south and they're building a temple, you're back to the same friction you had hundreds of years ago, and the people in the north are resenting it. And so here the writer of Ezra says they posture themselves as adversaries of the people rebuilding the temple. That's what's going on here. They are adversaries. And we're going to introduce a little bit more lion stuff in Peter. He writes in 1 Peter 5 8, look, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So I mean the take-home for us today isn't just the history of Ezra and Nehemiah. The take-home is, is how do you live in the midst of adversaries who are, whose purpose is set against you? How do you do that? Because here the people had been freed from the Persian Empire. Cyrus sent them back home with riches to rebuild the temple and resources. And they're doing it. And you think they, they lived happily ever after. They're out of captivity. But no, the people who live in the north resent them and they're actually opposed. They are adversaries to this build going on. And that is the backbone of the story of Ezra and Nehemiah to come, is this opposition from the people in the north. That's why this is so key to understand. How do we live amongst adversaries? Because whether you realize it or not, there are adversaries to the gospel and that adversary is the devil himself. And he's seeking opportunities to devour. That, before I go on, that has, always, that has always staggered me when I read that because I would prefer to believe that when evil exists in my community, in my culture, that it's not, it's not planned evil. <laughs> it's not opportunistic evil. It's not evil that's lurking for a weak spot in attacking. I would like to think that that's where I live. But unfortunately, in the spiritual world, that's not where you live. 
There is spiritual warfare going on. Paul talks a lot more about that. We don't have time to talk about it. But there is a war going on. And whether you like it or not, you're in that war. And that war is to suppress the good news of the gospel. So in this case, that war is there in order that the, the temple will not be rebuilt and the name of God will not be rehonored again. So this is what's going on. This is an active, it's an active planned evil. In this case in Ezra and in a daily life for us as well. And Peter's telling us that. Okay, so let's look at what the adversaries did then. Well, I'm going to categorize what they did in four categories. Let's start with that letter. Q. It's silly I do that. So um, let's see what they do. They do four things. So verse two. So they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the fa- and the heads of the fathers' houses and said to them. So here's the approach. This is the stalking lion. Are you ready for it? This is the stalking lion. Um, let's build with you. For we worship your God as you do, and uh, we have sacrificing. We have been sacrificing him ever since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. We would like to help you. Okay, we will help you. And by the way, we're one of you. Ever since the days of this guy Esarhaddon, and that's about a hundred years ago, he brought us back here, and we've been sacrificing and doing religious things all this time. We've been waiting for you. Can we just help you? We're from the government. We're here to help you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is the stalking lion. Can you see it? Because these are in that verse one. These are their adversaries talking. Don't forget, these are their adversaries talking who want to do everything possible to stop the rebuilding of the temple and the re-glorifying of God. Can we just, like, help you, you know? Hmm. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, now this is unanimous. Zerubbabel, he's actually kind of a semi unofficial king of the country. He's not really king, but he's like top dog in a way. Uh, Yeshua, he's also a guy who's a religiously connected, a top religious leader, and the heads of the Father's house, so everyone in the nation that's there. And we know from a couple weeks ago, it's about 40,000 heads of households. So there's a lot of people who are weighing in on this. Should we let the guys in the north help us build a temple? What should we do? And they all come to one mind, and this is what they say. You have nothing to do with us in building a house to our God. Nothing. But we alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. The answer is no. No. (laughs) No. No. Aren't you short on labor? Well, we are. But the answer is no. Why? We alone will build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So they realize that they're on a mission from God to rebuild the temple. And now this is a God whose reputation was kind of uh, you know, besmirched earlier when the northern kingdom was doing its own thing. So, the, so it's not really a pure intention in that sense. But they're also saying, not only are we on a mission from God, like the Blues Brothers said. Was that Blues Brothers? I think it was, yeah. I forget. We're on a mission from God. But we're also on a mission from from the king of Persia, the king of Persia, whom you guys, you know, pay your taxes to, the king of Persia told us to do this, not you to do this. So so they're invoking the authority of God himself as well as the authority of Cyrus, the king of Persia. They're saying, it's our job, you're not gonna help us. Now that was a pretty smart move, actually. A pretty smart move. Um, And and, and let me just tell you what this is. This is my, my first letter in this, is the strategy of infiltration and influence as a result. They're gonna infiltrate under the guise of being helpers, being free labor, and then in the process of becoming insiders in that, then what they will do is slowly pull the theology of the nation away from the God of Israel, and they'll influence it away from what it's meant to be. And this is classic, this is classic adversarial approaches, not only way back then, but like right now. Your adversaries, when they're not really clear your adversaries, will come in alongside and say, hey, can we do some stuff together? I mean, I'm just like you. I've been doing sacrifices too, and we've been brought back to this land, so I don't really see the downside. You know, we're so much alike. You ought to let us do with you what you're doing. We can help you. But really, the whole idea is to get on the inside and then slowly subvert what's going on. So then in the end, if they had helped, the temple probably would have never been built. 
probably never been built if they'd infiltrated successfully. So the question is, why, why is it that people like Zerubbabel and Yeshua, those guys who had to make the decision about whether to accept the, the free labor in a, such a gargantuan task as building the temple, why is it they so resolutely stood their ground and said, no, we're not going to let you? What is it they, they hearken back to? Now, it doesn't tell us too much here, but very clearly what they hearken back to is what they know about the God of Israel. And these Jews have come back who God has entrusted with building the temple. These are godly people. These are godly men. Men who, by the way, know the word. They know God's word. And so they can, they can, they can rest back on their knowledge of God based on what they know in God's word. And that's what they're using right here, is they're saying, no, wait a second. You guys claim to be just like us, but according to what we understand in God's word, you're not. You, you, you are entrusting yourself to a different God than we are. You may include him by name. Oh, yes, we, 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 serve, we serve Yahweh, Josh, uh, not Yahweh, Jehovah. We serve Jehovah. We're just like you. But they know from what their history was and what the revelation was and what happened between the two nations, they understand that these people really do not believe in the same God. They may use the same name for this God, but they don't believe in the same God. They don't believe in the same way that people in the South did in terms of really orthodox Old Testament. I, I would venture to say that what gave them quick insight about these guys trying to come in as imposters and to be helpful and what their real intentions are rather than being helpful is actually to stop the work is basically the fact that they were well anchored into the Old Testament. They understood. They understood the difference between the belief systems that had, had evolved in the North versus the South. They understood that these guys, although they might be sincere about their claim about we're into Jehovah as well, they understand that their heart's in a different place and they misunderstand him so much that they cannot touch this work. They cannot be part of this. Now, you bring that back to today. This is a strategy that's used a lot today and it's used a lot in religious contexts. A couple years ago, uh, <clears throat> when I was online, I saw a photograph of a billboard in Dayton, Ohio. And on this billboard, it said, it said, we are Christians just like you. And you know who funded the billboard? The Muslims in town. And so it, I'm not kidding you. I could show you the picture. I should show you the picture, but it's a copyright problem. But there was, we're Christians just like you. And then at the bottom, it said, asterisk, if by Christian you mean we believe in God and we're nice to people. I'm not kidding you. And then they put a website. So I went to the website. And when you go to the website, it's, it's a fundamentalist Islamic website. And, they, and the very entry page, the home pages you come in, talks to you about the fact, you know, we're more alike than you might think. In fact, we are one of the few religions, you and I, we are one of the few religions that believes that there's one God. There's one God. And we believe in the same God, but we just give him a different name. But we still believe in one God. If we believe in one God, you believe in one God, well, there's only one God. It must be the same God. So we believe in the same thing you do. And we believe in who Jesus is. They said this on their webpage. Well, they do believe in Jesus by name and historically, and I, I had a discussion when I was in Israel a long time ago with our, our Muslim guide and said, so what do you think of Jesus? Oh, we believe in Jesus. Well, there, there it was again. <laughs> what do you believe in Jesus? <laughs> well, we believe he was a real man. He was a respected man. He was a wise teacher. He was a prophet. Uh, we don't call him Jesus. We call him Isa. But, you know, yeah, we're, we're not anti-Jesus. Yeah, but you're not really pro-Jesus the way he defined it either. So you see, this is a classic kind of infiltration scheme, and they are putting it on billboards in Dayton, Ohio. So this happens across, across the entirety of the religious spectrum, it turns out. No one in the religious spectrum is anti-Jesus. That, that would be a bad thing. You'd, you'd, you'd drive people away instantaneously if you're, if you're anti-Jesus. The only people who are anti-Jesus are atheists. And they don't want you to join their religion anyway. So they're, But everyone who's got a religion has got to be, in some degree, pro-Jesus. That's just smart. But the actual belief in who Jesus is is far from the biblical idea of who Jesus is. The, the only common ground is he was a historical man who walked in the first century and he taught wise things and he was nice and good to people. And that's about, that's about where it ends. However, if you pull back into the large spectrum of eternity, 
you see that the son was eternally son with the father. He was the creator of everything. I mean, he's, he's, he's God incarnate, both God and man, simultaneously reaching out to the world to bring redemption and reconciliation between man and God. I mean, when you talk about that dimension of who Jesus is, no one goes for that. So you just have to be careful in this strategy. This strategy is to, is to say how much we have in common, but in, unless you ask the right questions, you can let someone in right alongside you who can slowly pull you off center from what you know. Now, what happens, just a practical thing, what happens if someone does come alongside you like that? How, how can you guarantee that they're not going to pull you off center about the theology of who Jesus is? Well, there's just like one antidote, and this is it. <laughs> so you really have to understand what's going on in this book, or you're, or you're sitting ducks. You're sitting ducks. I'm just saying. So this is the anchor toward what we believe. And I believe that that anchor is what caused Zerubbabel as well as Yeshua to say, nope, not today, guys. You're really not part of us. You may know the name of Jehovah, but you're not part of us. And God is not going to allow you to dishonor him by people like you building his temple. Not going to happen. The word of God. Infiltrate and influence. Okay, that's number one. Then the people of the land, now we're talking the people in the north. Verse four, the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. And that's, uh, hey, that's the D word right down here. Ah, uh, discouraged. And they don't tell us much about the discouragement. But what would, you, what would you imagine they could say to discourage the people who were working 24-7 on the temple itself? What could you say to discourage them? This is where you can use a little bit of divine speculation. What? <laughs> You're never going to finish this, man. <laughs> yeah. This is going to take forever. Never going to happen in your lifetime, so Joanne, just give up right now. Yeah. What else could you say? You could, it's very easy when you want someone not to do something. You can say things. You can plan things to kind of push their buttons and discourage them. What a dumb idea. What a dumb idea. I didn't, there was another one. I didn't. It's going to be 105 degrees all week. <laughs> <laughs> going to be 105 degrees all week. You don't really want to build this in the hot sun, do you? I mean, where's this going to get you? We've been living in the north all this time doing sacrifices, and we haven't needed a temple. Why are you guys busting your chops doing this? I mean, this is just such a waste of time. And after all, when Solomon built his great temple, what happened to that, huh? What happened to that, huh? Well, some big powerful guy comes in and pushes it over. You're going to spend your whole life, maybe you and your children's lives, building this stupid temple, and some big toot is going to come in like Nebuchadnezzar, and, pfft, and he's going to push it over. What's the point? Discourage me, VJ. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Tell me the truth, whether you believe in Jesus or not. Tell me the truth if you believe in Jesus or not. Yeah, and they could say, tell me the truth. Do you really believe in this God who wants you to build this temple? Did he really tell you? back in Babylon to build a temple? I mean, really? What's the advantage? Another way of discouraging is to just get in the way. Just get in the way. Yeah. Yep. Just be an obstacle all the time. Oh, sorry. Am I in your way? Sorry. Yeah. Or, or actually just going to the work site all day and just slightly, you know, intimidating people all the time. There's a lot of ways to do it. Now, dial back to when Noah was building his ark. It took 120 years. And he had people in his culture come out and ridicule him the entire time. Like, okay, so you're going to build a boat? Dude, where's the water? Huh? Well, it's coming. Who says? Well, God says. Right. When? When, right. <laughs> yeah, and you know, when you're building something for 120 years, people are going to say, you know, you're saying water's coming. I don't see any water. I mean, and you're going to finish this thing, and once you finish this thing and the water doesn't come, you're going to be so discouraged, you're going to kill yourself because you think, why did I waste such a long time building something I was never going to get into? I mean, this is stupid. Just, just save yourself that discouragement, man, and just get off the ladder and quit putting a pitch on the gopher wood, you know? There's a lot of ways to discourage. 
and you, and you do it kind of softly from the edges, and you don't look like an adversary necessarily, but you do look like an irritant. So this is, this is, a, this is actually like escalating effectiveness, not es escalating overtness is the idea. First you infiltrate and then slowly pull someone off center. The other one is just hang around the edges and just kind of drop comments until they're discouraged. Now this, this happens today too, all the time when we have debates about religious beliefs. It happens especially uh, in the debates that I watch between secular scientists and, say, for instance, Christian believers, where the, the scientists will say one thing that's totally aimed at discouragement, totally aimed at discouragement. And, and they want you to kind of go, oh, yeah, wow, you know. They, 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 they want you to consider what they think is a brown-proof argument. I, I got I to gotta tell you right now, just from a summary perspective, m my whole training is in science, uh, electrical engineering, physics, quantum physics, electromagnetics. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a science guy. I'm sorry I'm a nerd. But I haven't heard a scientific argument yet that holds any water in these debates. Yet. I haven't heard a single one. A single one. So it's, it's kind of a phony debate. But, but if, you don't, if, if you don't have a requisite science background, you can't understand why the scientific claims that are being made are really kind of full of hot air unless you see more about the substance of the science behind it. So, um, so it's really kind of a stupid argument in that sense. But, they, but these comments are all made to discourage you. So you say that God created the universe? Like he's the guy behind the Big Bang? Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah in the beginning, God created that. Well, then, okay, here's the question you can't answer. Scientists will say. If God created everything, then who created God? Can't answer that, can you? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. God's eternal. He never had a beginning. That's what it says in the Bible. He, he never had a beginning. He's eternal. That's what eternal means, man. You missed it. You're presuming that God is just like the creatures he put in his creation that have beginnings. He never had a beginning. Oh, uh, see, so it's like you, you get. Anyway, discouragement is an easy thing to loft. Again, what is the best way to protect your heart against discouragement? Uh, this thing. <laughs> this thing. God's words to us are meant to be an anchor in the midst of that discouragement. Okay, they do something else. Third tactic. First, first they infiltrate. Second, they discourage the people of Judah. Um, and then they made them afraid to build. <laughs> Now, how do you do that? Let's, let's engage our divine speculation again. What could they say to the people building the temple that would make them afraid? We don't, we don't, there's no answer to this. I don't know the answer, but we can speculate a little bit. It's fun to just sit here and go, let's see, what would I say to a guy who's busting his chops in the sun, putting together these gigantic limestone blocks... <laughs> What would, I, what would I say so he would be afraid? So he'd say, honey, I'm not going in to work on the temple today because I'm, I'm terrified. Oh, by the way, this is where you answer. The lions. Oh, lions. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go, go ahead. Yes. If, I, I think this is the best argument myself, but you guys might have better. That's why I love asking you because sometimes I get stuff I just never think about. But th I think that for me, this is the biggest one. Look, if you finish this, if you finish this, we're going to rat on you to the king. Now, time has gone enough by that Cyrus is close to not being the benevolent king anymore and someone's going to take his place. So if you sort of wait this out a little bit, you can say, I'm going to wait till the next king comes in. And if you, if you build this, not only is he going to race in here with his troops and knock it over again like Nebuchadnezzar did, but he'll kill everyone who is working on it just so you won't start it over again. So just save yourself the, the heartbreak and just stop. Just stop. The, uh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah. That's, that's very likely. Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly true, too. Yeah. I, I think there's lots of ways. There's lots of ways if you want to intimidate someone, you can make them afraid to continue forward. And almost all of your arguments are just totally made up. <laughs> Nine times out of ten. However, again, 
when and if you go to Israel, you'll be able to see one of the Herodian Herod stones uh, that was part of the, the base base foundation of that gigantic wall around that flat area. Uh, well, no, you can't. I have I, to qualify. If you're a woman, you can't see it. But if you're a man, you can. It's in a section that's kind of segregated by sex. But anyway, an incredibly huge stone. So what I would say, what I would say is like, look, you don't want to go into work there making that temple. You know those big limestone stones you're using? I mean, they're not the size of cement blocks. They're the size of cars. <laughs> they're the size of cars. The one I saw was the size of a, size of a semi-truck. It's huge. It's huge. You don't want to go into work today because you know what? Someone's going to do something wrong and it's going to slip on the log or the rope that's holding it and you're just going to get smushed like a bug underneath it. That is dangerous work, man. And the higher those walls get, you know, they're not cemented together. There's no rebar in them. There's no attachments. There's no fasteners. They're staying on top of each other with gravity. One of these days, someone's going to tip it the wrong way or they're going to put the next stone on them. Boom! And you're going to have tons and tons of this limestone crushing you like a bug. Don't go into work. It's dangerous. You could use, you could use a lot of arguments. You could. So they made them afraid. This is, this is part and parcel of what goes on today too. This happens a lot now in modern discourse where uh, a topic comes up you want to talk about. But before you can actually respond to that topic, let's say it's on the internet or something like that, the first thing you think is, what, what's going to happen to me if I say this? I mean, is this, is this an okay thing to say? What, what if this makes people angry? You know, what if there's retribution because I put it here and they can find me because I'm on the internet, I'm right there. Maybe I better not say anything. So fear actually rules your, your whole discussion structure in many respects, because you're afraid of, not just what people will think, but you're afraid of retribution. And, and it gets even worse in the modern day, is that as we become very post-Christian, you can, you can rationally fear losing your job. Rationally fear losing your job. It's supposed to be illegal, but it happens. And, and it's not just because of religious beliefs, it can just be beliefs that are outside of the idealistic center line of the culture, and you can lose your jobs. You can have your bank accounts frozen. I said that just so I looked at Roy because that was Canadian. <laughs> no, no big thing on Canada. But I mean that that happened during the trucker strike. Yeah, it, it, the government, and it, that can happen here. That can happen anywhere in the world. That happens in other parts of the world routinely, by the way. Yeah, so, so, you can, so every, every dime that you have saved in the bank that you use every week to go down to the grocery store and buy groceries, you may not be able to access that cash. That's, that's not just like a maybe, that's happening in the world. Why? Because you're an ideological enemy of the people who control that stuff. So, so this, this fear is a real thing in our culture when it comes to talking about the gospel. And uh, it, can, it can take you into these bad places. So all it takes for someone who wants to discourage you and move into the area of fear is to remind you of what could happen to you if you make a misstep. So why don't you just stop doing this? Is it really worth losing all that for you to do this? Is it really worth that? Really? And you go, oh, I don't know. There's lots of, there's lots of fronts that you can bring fear to a situation. And as time goes on in our fallen culture, there'll be a lot more fear levers that are used against believers when it comes to talking about who Jesus is and what redemption and reconciliation is all about. And these fearful levers will be used more and more when they understand that our conversations about the gospel start with all us, all we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're calling me a sinner? Well, yeah, because we all are. You're calling me a sinner? <laughs> well, yeah, we are. I'm not a sinner. You're perfect? Well, I do a few things wrong, but I'm not a sinner. I mean, I'm not a sinner worthy of the condemnation of God. I mean, I mean, we all mess up, right? Well, uh, sinner. <laughs> and so, and so there's lots of motivations for people to want to discourage and for people to bring fear into you promoting that, promoting that. Made them afraid to build. And then finally, number four, <laughs> cash is king. They bribed. They bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. So when, when you can't do that kind of direct approach, what you do is you hire an army of people that will do it for you. And how do you hire an army of people to do it? You pay them. You just pay them. This happens today, too. Uh, by the way, if you're online watching this looking for tips on how to be evil, don't copy this list. B 
because we don't want to give you tips on how to be evil. But this is how evil will be visited upon you. There will be people who will come into your sphere of influence who have actually been paid to do all these things. And uh, there is some record in the, in the recent decade or so of a lot of unrest in the country that's come as a result of people who are paid to do it. And this is just, this is just coming to light now in the last couple of years. There are, there are people who value the fact that you can be opposed to, to uh, uh, I'd call it adversarial ideals in public and then riot as a result or, or dox people or do whatever it takes to kind of bring fear and discouragement into people's lives. And the best way to really multiply your efforts is if you've got cash, just buy people to do it for you. Bribe them. Just bribe them. Happens today quite a lot. It's, it's, it is, in fact, uh, quite a black industry in terms of bribing for influence. <clears throat> I, it goes without saying this happens routinely in the government, every government of the world, <laughs> is you, you pay people to push ideologies. And there's, there's nothing really wrong with pushing or promoting a program <clears throat> in a general sense, but one becomes quite, quite disingenuous in terms of being good for the country, then it's a different kind of thing. But I'm just saying, bribery works really, really well. And uh, unfortunately, in the history of mankind, it is a truism that wicked people somehow get a lot of money. <laughs> and in so doing, can multiply their efforts through bribery. It's just, it's the way it works. So, so this, these are the approaches that they took. You, you infiltrate and then influence slightly. You discourage people by constant digs at what they're doing. You tell them the consequences of what they do are going to be uh, bad for them. And then you pay people in order to multiply the number of people it takes to be able to do this influence. And this is what's going on four or five centuries before Jesus. <laughs> and it's still going on 20 centuries after. This is humanity. Now, what's interesting in this as we close this is this was going on all the days of Cyrus, good king. He's the one that let him go. Cyrus, king of Persia. Even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Quick, we need timelines. Cyrus was, uh, he was in charge from 550 to 530 of the Assyrian uh, Empire. There's a slight break in who's in charge and then Darius comes on the scene in 522 to 486. Well, if you're starting to do a little math here, you're realizing, wait, this just isn't like something they did for a couple months. This is something that outlasted Cyrus and actually moved its way into King Darius. We're talking not a couple of weeks or a couple of months. We're call, talking maybe a couple of decades, a couple of decades of these strategies going on. <clears throat> and then in the reign of Ahasuerus, or uh, actually he's the king that's in Esther, the book of Esther, the king. Yeah. So at the time, I decided to, to study up how you say Ahasuerus in the original language. Ahasuerus. I just, I just had to try. Ahasuerus. Okay. In the reign of Ahasuerus, which is there, which is even later, and in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So like you're saying, Sandy, they did. They wrote, they wrote a complaint to the king. But by this time, it's gone through a couple of uh, different kings. And, and now they're writing, but the timeline is what's fascinating here. It's really fascinating here because now we're up ugh, 485, 465. It's a long time. And not only that, when they write this accusation, which we'll look at next time, you know, you know who they address it to? What king they address it to? It's not, it's not Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus. It's not Darius. It's not Cyrus. They address it to another king after that. And who's that? This is how it starts. To Artaxerxes, the king. <laughs> well, who the heck is that? Well, he, he's 464 to 423. So by the time they finally write this letter, they've had one guy replace another guy, replace another guy, replace another guy, and they're up to Artaxerxes, and he's in here, and so they address it to him around this period of time. So when you do the timeline, if that's there, and you go backwards to when Cyrus told him to leave, that happened back in 539 BC. So when you look at the time between they were released from captivity and in just a couple of years, they started the temple work. And then all the way over to the letter of complaint that gets written to the mayor of the world, who at the time is Artaxerxes, you're talking about 75 to 110 years. <laughs> so this has been going on a, a long time. And this raises a fascinating question. How do you and I persist under 100 years of adversarial persecution? Because this is what we're talking about. 
this is what, remember I said to you at the beginning, that 100 years, this is it right here. What we just read is a summary of the oppression they went through for over 100 years. 100 years. This sets the table for what we're going to look at for the rest of Ezra and Nehemiah because this kind of persecution is ongoing. And this letter to the king is read by the king, and we hope that when he reads it, he doesn't shut things down. So this is also the timeline of all of Ezra and Nehemiah. So the, so the statement we just read today with all those kings' names and the dates of those kings and the oppression and all the sneakiness on the part of the people in Samaria and the north, this is, this is an overview statement of the whole rest of Ezra and Nehemiah. Remember how I told you at the beginning of Ezra, it seemed like a miracle that Cyrus was led by God to let them go away as slaves? And so in the very first chapter of Ezra, and we're looking forward to reading the rest of Ezra and Nehemiah and thinking, well, it's like the end of the story. You know, he's got the story backwards. You're supposed to talk about oppression and horrible stuff and we're slaves and stuff like that. And then you get to the last chapter, you know that chapter you read in the bookstore and you read the last page so you can find out how it turns out. And the last page is supposed to be, and King Cyrus let them go to go back and build the temple. The end and they all lived happily ever after. Well, that was in chapter one of all this. It seems like that's the end of the story, not the beginning of the story. It's the beginning of the story because from here on out in Ezra and Nehemiah, we're talking about this kind of persistent oppression that's going on. It's not about being released from captivity to build the temple. It's about how do you live in a world where you're under constant oppression. Constant oppression. By people who are kind of your half-siblings, racially speaking. By people who are close. To people who ancestrally share a lot of your background. Back to Solomon and back to David. How can you put up with that kind of close and nearby persecution and niggling kind of discouragement? All the time? How do you live in that circumstance? And so that's what we look at as we go forward in Ezra. That's what it's all about. That's why this is so important because this is actually an overview outline of the whole rest of the two books. This right here. This is just gigantically important. 75 to 110 years. Paul says in his famous spiritual warfare section, Ephesians 6, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, these spiritual opponents that we have against the gospel have an incredible amount of patience and endurance. And so they will continue to oppress and discourage and give fear and infiltrate. This is, this is the life that we have now assumed as we become followers of Jesus. Jesus warned his apostles, look, if they, if they treat me this way, they're not going to treat you any better. <laughs> you know, Because there's a, there's, a fundamental, there's a fundamental resistance in the world to the good news of the good news. It's just going to be resisted. And it got Jesus killed. There was that resistant. So, so Paul says in Ephesians 6, you got to understand you are indeed in a warfare. You're in a battle. You may not even be aware of it. And you'd really prefer not to be in the midst of one. But I'm sorry, you are. You are. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are. And in the spiritual realm, we don't battle against flesh and blood. We battle against an enemy who is extraordinarily clever and insightful and has an extraordinary amount of patience. He knows how to push your buttons to discourage you. He knows how to push your buttons to give you fear. He knows how to incorporate other people in the job for him by promising them things. That's the bribery part. This is, this is the battle that we're in right now. So as we move forward in Ezra and Nehemiah, how do, you, how do you go forward in doing what God has asked you to do, especially when it comes to talking about what the gospel is about, knowing, fully knowing, that when you bring that up, you're going to create enemies? I mean, how do you do that? And I'll, and I'll tell you how I do that because this is, this is uh, something I go through almost every day, every other day or so, is I remind myself that even though when I look out the window after I get up in bed and I see the sunshine and I see the birds chirping <laughs> and I see happiness and I drink my cup of coffee or, or I have my sweet uh, food for breakfast, which I don't anymore, but I mean, I, everything looks rosy and hunky-dory and there's birds flying and singing outside my window. I have to remind myself, well, actually, I'm in a war zone. You know, it'd be easy if I looked out the window and I saw gigantic bomb craters in the front yard. I'd know I'm in a war. But it looks like I'm not in a war. But we have to remind ourselves we are in a war. And there's a lot at stake in this war. A lot at stake. And that's the lives of other people who haven't come to understand yet about the incredible goodness of the good news. And we have an enemy right there. We have an enemy who's, who's engaging 
in order to discourage us and give us fear and to take us out of the game. That's what his job is. And he can be extraordinarily successful at it. And if you think that in your own power you can outsmart him, you're wrong. That makes you a sitting duck. <laughs> what you really need to do is say, and this is what I do when I get up, say, God, I don't know what's ahead of me today. I don't know what kind of darkness lingers around me. All I know is, is I love you and I want to follow you today. I want to speak the truth about your incredible love manifest in the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf so that I can be reconciled to fellowship with you. I want people to know that. And so God, I don't know how to deal with all this other stuff that floats around that's against me and against you. I don't know how to deal with that. I'm too stupid to be able to really engage that well enough. I need you starting right now the rest of my day. And then I remind myself of the persistent, everlasting loving kindness of God. And then you can go out in the middle of the bomb craters in your front yard, <laughs> you know, spiritually speaking, I mean, and you can say, there's such great news. There is such great news. I mean, Dorothy, Dorothy and I have been talking recently with uh, someone who's come to us who's just really struggling, really struggling, not a believer. And... Um, and my heart just goes out to her so many times every time I hear her speak because she, she doesn't have a sense of how good the good news is. And she, she is, she's, been, she's been part of a group that's been infiltrated and influenced away from the truth about who Jesus is. And it's a, it's a heartbreak to me and it's a frustration to me because I think, well, what can we say? What, what can we do in order to shine light on what is really a pretty bleak and dark existence? And I'm, I'm not smart enough to know how to do that. You have to rely on God's Holy Spirit. His Spirit is inside you so that in every place you go and every person you talk to, He is speaking through you. He is acting through you. You have to rely on Him to do that. And in the midst of that then, Amazing things can happen. I could tell you stories, but I'm out of time. I won't tell you stories, but maybe you probably have some already where, where suddenly you think, well, I'm going to put this out there. I know when I say this, I'm either going to be ridiculed or, or whatever. You know, I, I, just, I don't think this has any traction in that person's life, but okay, God, I'll say it. Did you know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son who ever believes in him and had everlasting life? And you're thinking, this is not going to go anywhere. And they respond. You don't know who God is prepping. And it has little to do with your abilities. It has everything to do with his abilities resident in you. God, God does not want you to do for him what only he plans to do through you. It's an important thing to remember. I'll tell you just one quick story. I, I don't know if I've told you this before, but it's worth telling again because many of you haven't heard it. So, so years, ago, years ago, I was involved in, uh, as a volunteer in Young Life, which is a Christian outreach um, to youth in high schools, meeting people's houses and stuff like that. I did that for a while when we were first married. And there was, a, uh, there was a night where we had very poor showing, about four kids, and where we normally had 20 or 30 in the living room of someone's house. And so I told the leader who was there at the time, there were just three of us, three leaders, I said, you know, we just bag it tonight. We've only got three kids here. It's just, this is a waste of time. And we had big things planned, big games, big skits, big singing, hoo-ha, you know, critical mass, all that kind of stuff. I said, come on, Paul, this is just not worth it. No, no, I know what we're going to do. We're going to take all these kids and we're going to cram them in my white van and we're going to cram in there with them, three kids, three adults, and we're going to go all over town and we're going to pop out in town someplace and sit on the curb and we'll do the skit. And then we'll go back in the van, we'll drive another part of town, and we'll, and we'll get up on the curb, and we'll do some singing, and then we'll get back in the van and go to another part of town, and Jim, you'll do your talk, because that was my night to do the talk, and then we'll get back in the van, come back to my house, kids will be picked up by their parents, we'll be done. I said, this is stupid. So we did that. We did that. I have vivid memories of, you know, you know the drive throughs in banks? Vivid memories of us sitting on the curbs in the, in the drive through because it was one of the few lit places in town. <laughs> And, and doing skits. I'm, I was sure the cops were going to come any second. What are you doing here? Well, it's a little hard to explain. Uh, but I'm selling pencils, and this guy over here, uh, so anyway, so um, that was the skit, by the way. But anyway, so I do my talk. I remember sitting the kids on this curb under this one street lamp in the middle of the suburban neighborhood, and I did my talk. It was all of five minutes, five minutes. I did this talk. I talked about the woman who, uh, who, uh, who came up to Jesus, touched the, the hem of his cloak remember that she'd been bleeding all those years had doctor try and help her anyway I did some version of that story we did the story we went back in the van we went back to, to, to the house parents picked him up and I thought waste of time then about two years later 
maybe th for three, two to three years later, there was a fundraising banquet for Young Life. I, at that time, I'd been out of Young Life. Uh, we were, Dorothy and I were doing a music ministry, so I didn't have time for it. But we went to this fundraising banquet, a large, ba large um, banquet room inside a hotel where, where people in Young Life get up and they make a pitch for why you need to support the ministry. It's really a, it's a wonderful thing to this very day. <clears throat> and I remember we had, we had put together a table of people, eight people at our table, round table, and we're eating spaghetti. And, and for courtesy to my friends who wanted to see what was going on, I, had my, I was the one in the round table with my back to the stage, so I, I didn't look at the stage. So one of the things that they do in those things is they have leaders come up and talk about the ministry. And then they always try and have one of the high school students who's come to Jesus come up and give a quick testimony. So I'm sitting there and I'm eating. I literally remember this. I'm eating my spaghetti like this, trying not to get that red stuff on my shirt. And I'm eating my spaghetti and I hear her introduce this gal. She gets up and she says, yeah, I graduated uh, last year. And, uh, and, uh, and she says, uh, I came to Jesus because there was this one night that we sat on a curb. And, and then I stopped eating my spaghetti. I thought, wow, that's kind of odd. Other people do that too, I guess. <laughs> and, and she said, and then she recounted the entire story of that woman who touched Jesus' cloak. The entire story. The entire story. And then I thought, she was right in front of me on the curb. And I was willing to toss the entire evening. <sighs> so I actually started crying in my spaghetti. <laughs> So it was, a, it, it was a very sweet moment of conviction from God. Don't you ever, don't you ever under, under, undersell the power of the gospel of God in every, any context you tell it, even if it looks like it's a total waste of time. Because in the people whose hearts God has been preparing, it gets snagged there and it grows and that, that seed grows and develops and completely out of your influence and out of your control, God brings an incredible thing and all you said was something very simple about the loving kindness of God. Now, it's true a lot of people will stiff arm that. A lot of people will set about trying to ruin your life because of that. A lot of people are opposed to that message altogether. But there are some that it snags in and God brings them to himself. So if you think, you know, I don't, in this culture, I don't know if it's worth saying the gospel. It is. It is. And you may never for the rest of your life understand how many of those seeds sprouted. And I think only in God's graciousness he allowed me to see that one in order to rebuke me <laughs> in a great way, in a great way. Paul said, when I came to you, did I use lofty language? No. Did I, did I take advantage of my great intellectual academic training as an Old Testament theologian? No. Nah. What did I do, he said? Do you remember what I did, he said? I talked about the gospel. I talked about the cross. The cross and Jesus crucified. Simple. The love of God manifest in Christ himself who died on our behalf that we might have a solution to our self-imposed sin and be reconciled to a holy God. And that's, that's it. How long did it take me to say that? Uh, 30 seconds. So anyway, I just want to encourage you. In the midst of opposition, in the midst of infiltration, in the midst of discouragement and fear-mongering, in the midst of people, an army of people bribed to oppose you, your job is still very simple. Don't be discouraged by that. Keep building the ark. Keep building the temple. Keep talking about the loving kindness of God. Okay? All right, let's quit. Father, we thank you for this account. We thank you for preserving for us through all these generations your word. What a tremendous thing this is. What a story this is. And God, our hearts go out to those among whom we live, friends and, and, and family and so many who, who sit hopeless, uh, who sit in, the, in darkness, and uh, like Isaiah says, the shadow of death, who, who find no reason to hope and no reason to look forward to anything. And Lord, I think about our neighbor friend like that. There's, there is so much discouragement and so much hopelessness. So, Lord, use us like you say you plan to use us as lights in a dark place. And may we never, never compromise our ability to be able to speak the simple truths about you because we are fearful or because we're discouraged or because we're afraid that an army of people come after us. But, Lord, just to say the simple truth, that God so loved the world that he gave his son. And, Lord, we are now called your children 
and not just called your children, we are your children. And we are flabbergasted by that honor. And our hearts are overflowing in love because you first loved us. So thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.